I would like to start uh, welcoming you all to the 53rd webinar of the graduate program in physics of the Federal University of Pará in Amazonia, Brazil. I ask everyone to kindly leave the cameras and microphones turned off, except for the moment you're going to speak. Questions will be allowed after the webinar, unless otherwise requested by the speaker. The questions can be asked using the chat, both in this virtual room and in YouTube. Today, uh, we have the honor to listen to Professor Warren Pickett, who obtained his PhD in physics from Stony Brook University in New York in 1975. After spending 18 years in theoretical condensed matter physics research at the Naval Research Laboratory in Washington, DC, he joined the Department of Physics and Astronomy of the University of California, Davis, in 1997. Much of his research revolves around computational implementations of the density functional approach to understanding electronic behavior at the microscopic level with ap applications to some of the most intriguing condensed matter physics questions. The phenomena that are studied include high temperature superconductivity, half-metallic ferromagnetism and anti-ferromagnetism, Materials behavior under extreme conditions, including appearance of high temperature superconductivity, polar discontinuities at interfaces, and confinement effects in nanostructures, and exposition of rel relativistic effects from spin orbit coupling in condensed matter, including topological character and indices. Among the recognitions and awards received by Professor Warren Pickett, I can mention the Scientific Achievement Award from Washington Academy of Sciences in 1985, Fellow of the American Physics Society in 1989, E.O. Hubert Award from Naval Research Laboratory in 1990, Sigma Chi Technical Achievement Award in Pure Science from the Naval Research Laboratory in 93, Humboldt Research Award for Senior U.S. Scientists in 2005, and fellow of the Institute of Physics in 2011. Well, but we are here today to listen to Professor Pickett, so I won't take your time further with this introduction. So, Professor Warren Pickett, thank you again very much for having accepted our invitation, and from this moment on, the stage is yours. Good morning, all. Thanks for that very nice introduction. Uh, and it's good for me to be back in Brazil I have visited Brazil a few times uh, in order, uh, Campinas, Sao Paulo, Rio, Brasilia, Belo Horizonte, but I've never been to the Amazon before. So uh, I'm happy to be there, visit in this sense at least. It's not as warm and as humid as I had expected, but, um, but we'll continue here. And uh, this is going to be uh, a quite general talk about superconductivity over the past hundred years, uh, with a little focus here on there on certain items. I want to acknowledge uh, first, under my name here, Yundi and Soam were my two last postdocs, and uh, we published a couple of papers together uh, in 2019 on this topic. And uh, I won't get into those, what's in those papers because this is a more general talk, but I want to acknowledge them. So uh, <clears throat> the condensed matter physicist and even chemist in the audience will have already heard something about superconductivity. Here is a, a magnet that is levitated over a superconductor, chunk of superconductor. Uh, you'll see a little bit more on levitation pretty quickly. Now, this is room temperature. Or we, we're getting very close, if not to room temperature, and I will get to that toward the end of the talk. Uh, but I just want to show you a very nice poster from a workshop that I attended at Notre Dame University in 2005 titled The Possibility of Room Temperature Superconductivity. And it was a very interesting conference. Uh, we didn't come up with any breakthroughs, but it's uh, very nice. And uh, about three other conferences I've attended or workshops on the possibility of room temperature superconductivity. And finally, in the last uh, four years, uh, we're getting very close. 
It requires a lot of pressure, but that's okay. Okay, I think probably you're all familiar with the basic phenomena of superconductivity. Here is the electrical resistivity versus temperature. And in a normal metal, non-superconducting, it's very smooth and levels off. And because metals aren't perfect, it doesn't go to zero at zero temperature, but to a finite value. But in a superconductor, and it doesn't matter, the superconductor doesn't have to be clean, be a resistivity of the same form as here, but at the critical temperature, Tc, the resist resistance goes to zero. And there's what you have it there. And here is actually the, the data, uh, which you can barely see, but this is from Kamerling Otis's paper, uh, 1911, where he announced superconductivity in mercury at 4.2 Kelvin. What he was doing was just trying to um, achieve the lowest temperatures he could with helium. And what he was doing was measuring the resistivity of mercury, and it went away at 4.2 Kelvin. Here's, here's the data. And the, the Meissner effect uh, in a superconductor is if you put the metal in a magnetic field and then lower the temperature until it becomes superconducting, what happens is it expels the magnetic field. This is the typical schematic picture. Actually, the most interesting superconductors are type 2 superconductors and they don't expel all the magnetic field. It's not shown here, but what they do is there are vortices left in the material in which the magnetic field goes through the superconductor, and at the cent center of the vortex, the material is actually, is actually normal, but then, um, but the whole material as a whole is superconducting, and still the resistance is zero. So here's another levitation, the magnet, over a probably an yttrium barium copper oxide, a superconductor cooled below to 70, 70 degrees, which is enough. And here's another example. Okay, so from 1911 until 1957, uh, just what was happening in this superconductor was, was a big mystery. Uh, and then things started to happen. Uh, but better superconductors were discovered along the way. Uh, just mentioned here, uh, superconductivity uh, has a few uses in uh, applications. We would like to be able to use it in power transmission, electrical power transmission around the country, because about 8% of electrical power is lost in, in resistance in our lines and in transformer uh, action between different networks and so forth. And if one could get rid of that 8% loss, that would actually be a pretty significant development. Well, here's a 200 ton superconducting magnet for fusion power. Um, here's a prototype Japanese maglev train, magnetic uh, levitation. And here is a magnetic resonance imaging application of uh, superconducting coils. About half of the MRI machines in, in practice now um, are the old type, which have coils that require a lot of electricity, uh, but half of them are superconducting coils. It's a more expensive machine, but it's more efficient to run. So there are a few applications of superconductivity already. Uh, again, here is just uh, a demonstration of me and uh, my colleague, Valentin Tofur, and his undergraduate student, whose name I didn't put on here and I've forgotten at the moment, but she, she set this up. She's used to handling the liquid nitrogen and so forth. And this is a track of magnets uh, put all around this circle. And what happens is in this yttrium barium copper oxide sample, um, if you start it out just right, and you'll see that soon done on a video, then the magnetic field vortices are trapped inside the superconductor and hold on to it. 
And so this thing goes around the track. You uh, start it. It just goes, follows the track, the magnets, and you can turn it upside down. And it's it's held there. Uh, it forces stronger than gravity. Gravity doesn't pull it down until it warms up above the critical temperature, and then it just becomes a normal metal. <coughs> okay, now. I'm going to show you a uh, demonstration video, which I've called Modern Here, and I'll follow it again immediately with what I'll call a more modern demonstration video, which you will understand. This one is courtesy of a lab in Dresden that I visited, and this is courtesy of Lexus, remarkably. So let me go there and uh, find these. That's the wrong window. It's here. And so the first one is a more conventional sort of demonstration. Um, okay. And we start this and we'll listen to the narrator. One doesn't have to be a passionate fan of model trains to be fascinated by the way this steam engine looks. Hovering a few millimeters over the rails, it goes round and round without any friction and without any motor. On top of that, it really steams. But it's not water that evaporates inside the model steam engine, but liquid nitrogen, so cold that humidity condenses on it. The core of this magnetic levitation train is a superconducting material which conducts electric current without any resistance at temperatures below minus 183 degrees Celsius. In this state, it's able to trap magnetic fields. The resulting magnetic forces cause not only the levitation, but precision control above the rail, which is made of conventional magnetic material. An impressive experiment is designed to demonstrate how strong the forces are which hold the superconductor on the track. The superconductor is brought into a certain distance of a few millimeters above the magnetic rail and cooled down in this position using liquid nitrogen. Reaching the specific transition temperature of minus 183 degrees Celsius, the superconductor traps the magnetic flux of the outer field. Now we can remove the shim of a certain thickness which determines the distance. The superconductor has now memorized its position within the field of the rail. The superconductor is fixed at this distance and can only move along the magnetic rail even when turning upside down. But the effect lasts only as long as the superconducting state in the material is maintained. To set the superconducting levitation train in motion, one has only to give it an initial impulse by hand. Okay, so I'm Into going to skip ahead. The steep for physicists, but it could soon become reality for technicians. Of course, it remains questionable whether superconducting trains really will breeze along storefronts someday. However, some applications of this technique can already be envisaged, such as frictionless bearings or conveyance systems for clean rooms. Okay, that's the end of that video. And I will go directly to another one, which is more modern. And this uh, I, will, I will describe here bec because we don't need to listen to the music in the background. Okay, uh, go ahead and enlarge it a little bit more. And we'll start it. <laughs> Okay, so what, what this is all about is that a couple of decades ago, Lexus became aware that the age demographics of the people who are buying their cars uh, was increasing, and that what they wanted to do was to identify more and interest more the younger set of people so what they did was 
to build this track, this skateboard track, uh, in Barcelona. And what you see here is a superconducting skateboard, and beneath the surface, if the surface is there, uh, whatever the hard surface is, or if it's water, you'll see in a moment, there is a track of magnets. You can't see them, but there's a track of magnets that this follows. It has to follow, or, or if it gets out of there, then it won't, it won't be levitating. Uh, so what Lexus did was to, to get a, a skateboard champion from England, who's the guy with the beard here, so short beard, uh, to learn how to ride it. And it's not easy to learn because it doesn't behave like a real skateboard. There's no friction, first of all. And then you have to learn just how to stay on it because it's going to follow the track or else everything's going to stop. So here, the skateboard champion is learning how to ride it. And uh, here's a Lexus car. This is dem one of the demos they wanted to put together. And the skateboard going across the Lexus. Okay. So this is, and that's what happens when the superconductor warms up. Then the superconductivity is quenched. And that means it uh, becomes normal and then you're not levitating anymore and you fall off the skateboard. So that is a uh, more modern demonstration of superconducting levitation, superconductor against a magnet. And uh, one can imagine that if, if there's a right kind of market so they could build a hundred of these around the world and, and make it a profitable, uh, profitable sort of business, then superconductivity would be a lot better known to the average person than it is. Okay, so that is that those two demos. Let's go back to the talk now. <laughs> so we're going to go through most of the rest of the slides. A uh, quick trip through six decades from the 1950s to now. And uh, in 1957, the BCS theory of Bardeen, Cooper, and Schrieffer was published in Physrev Physical Review, actually the first short version in Physical Review Letters. And it was very quickly accepted because it even predicted uh, a few phenomena which had not yet been measured related to ultrasonic attenuation and nuclear magnetic resonance and so forth. And those were quickly observed in superconductors like mercury or aluminum. And um, so this is a paper that uh, has a lot of citations. As of 2007, when Sid Redner did, did this citation statistics report, um, of physical review, it had 1,400 citations. But in fact, uh, it's like it's like Schrodinger now. Nobody cites Schrodinger's papers when they use Schrodinger equation, and nobody cites BCS papers anymore. It's that well known. So that's 1957, and the one basic equation that we want to keep in mind here a little bit during this talk is their expression for this weak coupling uh, superconductivity that they described. So they actually wrote down a certain kind of pairing Hamiltonian and, um, and then created, wrote down a correlated wave function, which uh, explains uh, simple uh, superconductors very well. And the critical temperature, superconducting critical temperature in this model, is um, determined by a, a typical phonon pairing, uh, phonon frequency, omega, some average over the spectrum, which we don't need to go into, and a coupling constant, lambda. So um, this sets the scale for TC, and then lambda uh, is, back then especially, was substantially less than one. 
So this factor decrease at TC might be a factor of 10 or 20, smaller than the characteristic phonon frequency, but okay. But that's the basic behavior of a weak coupling superconductor. Uh, <clears throat> the mechanism works like this. There are various schematics you can find on uh, the web. This one was uh, created over here by my undergraduate student, Amber, uh, three or four years ago. And this is just showing that the initial picture is showing an electron coming in here like this. And as it's moving with wave vector K and spin up, spin isn't shown here, then it, it uh, attracts these positive ion cores. Tracks them, it attracts them sort of virtually because they're heavy and they don't have time to move, but it does create uh, schematically this distortion. And then when an electron comes with momentum minus K into the same region, it feels this effectively attractive region of positive charge. And uh, this gives an effective coupling between the electron with momentum K and spin up and momentum minus k and it turns out you need to have spin down for this to work like bcs described in field theory language <coughs> what one has is this is an electron self-energy diagram here's the electron coming in with momentum p here and it emits a phonon of wave vector p minus k and certain energy conserves energy at the vertices, and then it, it uh, extend, continues on with its original momentum P. This is a Feynman diagram for the electron self-energy. And uh, doing this in the superconducting state, what you find is that the electronic spectrum has a gap. That's the superconducting gap, and that's the basic reason why the superconductor does not have does not have any resistance anymore. This gap with special properties of the superconducting state. All right, from 1911 up through 1973, there was this sporadic but continuous increase in the maximum known critical temperature, TC versus real time for uh, 60 years and you're going to stronger coupling here, and TC was going up. Actually here, uh, things stopped. It was getting very hard because the, all the scientists working on this, physicists, chemists, material scientists, uh, for six years from here to here, TC only increased by six degrees. It was uh, very disappointing. A lot of material, hard material work here. So that's the background, and in 1973, Bruce Friday uh, sent in a, a short letter to the editor, Physics Today, uh, four paragraphs or so, and he included this figure, the same data here plotted, and he fit a straight line to it. He says it fits a straight line very well. And so, so uh, high temperature superconductivity is coming, uh, and it'll get to room temperature in the year. 2840. So if you just live a clean life and eat right and so forth, uh, well, you won't make it to 2840, I suppose. But um, that that was his little joke. Uh, the people who were working hard and did find it that humorous. But uh, <clears throat> that's where room temperature might be thought to uh, have been discovered at this time. Well, in the 1990s, the theory, the, the real nitty-gritty uh, strong coupling theory of superconductivity was developed. It was two papers in the late 1950s uh, by Migdal and by Ely Ashberg. Um, but in the 1990s, density functional theory was also maturing. So it was, we were able to treat already in the late 70s and 80s the basic electronic structure of crystalline materials very well. But in the 90s, this was merged with strong coupling superconductivity theory. 
Now, 2015, and I'm jumping ahead to, to near the end of the story, but uh, Mikhail Eremit's group in, in uh, Mainz uh, discovered TC of 200 Kelvin at a very high pressure of 160 gigapascals pressure. This is 1.6 megabar pressure, million atmospheres of pressure in hydrogen three sulfide, which of course is not five centuries, it's actually eight centuries before Bruce Friday's extrapolation. No, if you just go to 200 Kelvin, it's five centuries. That's why I wrote it that way. And then in 2018, Russ Simley's group in Chicago uh, discovered in what turned out to be lanthanum hydrogen 10, uh, TC of 260 Kelvin at 200 gigapascal. And this was pretty quickly reproduced by Aramets, who found in their sample 250 Kelvin. Uh, the same sort of data. All right. So... You've seen this slide almost uh, the same, except what I've put in here is that the experimental discovery was 2015. Actually, in 2014, Chan Sui's group predicted and published paper using this density functional theory based uh, computational suite of programs and calculated TC of 200 Kelvin in hydrogen three sulfide in a particular structure. And this was, this is sort of patent, patently silly because the maximum TC at that time in these kinds of superconductors was 40 Kelvin, which I will mention in a moment. But the, actually the theory came first and just uh, roughly a year later, it was discovered independently uh, by Aramat's group. So theory finally predicted superconductor before it was uh, discovered experimentally. And not only that, it's an extremely high temperature superconductor. <coughs> so theory was first here. And then theory was actually first uh, lanthanum hydrogen 10 also. Okay, so I'm going to just mention cuprate high temperature superconductivity. It's different. In 1986, um, two men who I will show the picture on the next slide, I believe, uh, found that an oxide, a copper oxide, became superconducting at about uh, 30 degrees Kelvin. And the rest of the world began working on this. And within Two months, early 1987, it was found that in yttrium barium copper oxide, um, the superconducting TC was 90 degrees Kelvin already. So there was a post deadline session at the American Society March meeting in 1987, uh, started at I think 7 p.m., maybe 8 p.m., whatever, and a large number of people who were working on these new superconductors were given eight or 10 minutes to, to say something. And this session lasted until about 3 a.m. in the morning. I only lasted until about 1 a.m. But it went on with, uh, you know, the crowd started out probably with 300 people or more than, more than could get into the room, actually. And, uh, but that's been called the Woodstock of physics. This is an amazing shock and uh, caused the exuberance in the community. So here are the discoverers, uh, George Bednortz and Alex Mueller in, at IPM Zurich. Here is the data. It's not very impressive data, but uh, the resistivity starts to go away at 30 degrees Kelvin. And within just a few months, other workers cleaned up this material. It's a lanthanum barium copper oxide system. And with 19 months from this paper, they were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics, the quickest Nobel Prize uh, for discovery ever to occur. I think it's almost rivaled now by the Higgs boson discovery. Okay, and then after this, in cuprates, TC was raised quickly from 40 Kelvin 
when this was cleaned up as 40 Kelvin to 93 Kelvin in yttrium barium copper oxide to 110 Kelvin, 125 Kelvin, and applying pressure even in this mercury compound, uh, 164 degrees Kelvin. That's still the highest critical temperature for a cuprate superconductor. This is a, a plot of uh, the highest TC known versus temperature, versus year, versus time. So here is the straight line we saw up until 1973. Then nothing happened until 1986. And then the cuprates behave like this. Okay. And in the meantime, magnesium diboride was discovered to be superconducting at 40 Kelvin. And it's the same sort of superconductor as these. And it's you see it's almost right on the straight line, by the way. Um, then in 2008, these iron-based superconductors were discovered. And their TC goes up to 56 Kelvin, as shown here. And I will come back here. This is just some of the crystal structures of these cuprate superconductors. The mercury-based one layer. Uh, yttrium barium copper oxide, two copper oxygen layers, lanthanum strontium copper oxide, one layer, and here is a, oh, this is still, I guess, just a one layer compound. It has, it has more stuff in between the layers than these do, but it's still superconducting. I'll come back to this right here shortly. Okay, this is the cuprate superconductor, the same structures, and there's a really interesting phase diagram here of uh, temperature on this axis, and this is a uh, whole doping in the material, alloying somehow, uh, replacing some oxygen, or usually uh, replacing one cation with another cation that has a different valence. But here's superconductivity and antiferromagnetic. Uh, state over here before you dope it, and a pseudo gap region which is still being investigated a lot. It has been investigated a lot. Strange metal phase here, and then over here is a normal metal phase once you get far over doped. That's the interest in cuprate superconductivity, and that continues still. Uh, it's non phonon mediated. Uh, phonons might be uh, implicated somehow also, but it's uh, there's a lot of magnetic activity even over here. So uh, it's a different kind of superconductivity than BCS in terms of the the mechanism. I just mentioned magnesium diboride. It's a very simply structured material. It has boron layers that are honeycomb uh, shape and layer, and then just the magnesium in between. The magnesium gives up its two electrons. So in fact, the boron becomes a sort of pseudo graphite, like carbon. Graphite is carbon in this structure, but just layers, nothing else here. And this, without any doping, uh, superconducts at 40 degrees Kelvin. And it's a phonon-mediated superconductor, BCS form. It's a little bit more interesting because unlike the BCS model with a single electron band, this has two distinct electron bands with different superconducting strengths. But otherwise, it's BCS-like. And what's unusual about it, it gets TC up to 40 Kelvin, the maximum TC in these kinds of materials had been 23 Kelvin since 1973. And it's this stretch mode of the bond that's extremely strongly coupled to uh, the electron state, bonding state, um, that involves these, um, involves the borons here also. This is, I won't go into this much, but this is a plot of the phonon frequencies, the lattice vibrational frequencies versus different directions and magnitudes of the momentum. You get these branches like this, and the dots shown here show the strength of coupling of that particular phonon 
uh, to the electrons at the Fermi surface. And what you can see here is most of the places you can't see the dots. The, the area is proportional to the strength of coupling, but there's this top branch, optic branch, which is this mode. There are two of them because it's two dimensional. <laughs> Those are extremely strongly coupled. And that's why this is a 40 Kelvin superconductor. And this density functional based apparatus I mentioned earlier was applied to this by several groups, including my own, and um, really understood the superconductivity very quickly within five, six, seven months of the discovery. It's not, for this material, it's not a very difficult calculation to do. Okay. Um, just mention iron based superconductors here. It's, it's unusual because we think of iron usually as being magnetic. And in fact, it is magnetic here. It's, it's a weaker form of magnetism than in elemental iron. But you see here is iron arsenide, say, layer. Another one up here, another one down here. And they're separated by these lanthanum oxide layers here. <coughs> or sometimes you can, you can put fluorine. Some, to take place some of the oxygens and change the properties somewhat. And it has a phase diagram. Um, it, the phase diagram varies somewhat for all the different iron-based superconductors that have been discovered, but there's an antiferromagnetic order in most of them before it's doped. And then there's a superconducting dome, what it's called here, and so forth. And there's a structural transition in this material also. So this is TC up to 55 Kelvin. Uh, this is just uh, <clears throat> to illustrate uh, most of the main classes of superconductors. Here is the superconducting critical temperature on log scale 1, 10, 100. It will break here and 250. And this is the ratio of the the magnetic critical field, that's the, the field which destroys the superconductivity, that divided by the critical temperature. And generally speaking, you would expect uh, the critical field to go up as the critical temperature goes up. And that is <clears throat> maybe the overall trend. If that were the case, it would just linear relationship, then it would just be a straight line across here. Um, but you see that um, although there are a lot of the materials occurring right in here, uh, the elements are down here, a completely different value. Again, a log plot here of this quantity. The heavy fermion compounds, cerium-based and uranium-based, um, are over here in the uh, green and the red. The superconducting material, sorry, the iron based materials are the iron based material, I think, are shown here. There are three plutonium compounds here, uh, which are actually heavy fermion materials, also. And uh, oh, here are the iron based materials, they're called nictides and the cuprates, and then the hydrogen based materials. Um, two were known at the time this plot was made by these two gentlemen. And, and there's quite a variation in this, this ratio. You can see log plot. So that's one of the interesting issues, broad issues in superconductivity. OK, back to this plot. And <clears throat> the, the new discovery in 2015 of hydrogen three sulfur, uh, not two, but three at 200 Kelvin, and then the hydrogen lanthanum hydride up here at 260 Kelvin um, in 2018 or 19, not shown here. And but hydrogen three sulfur has a very simple cubic structure, and hydrogen, uh, sorry, lanthanum hydride. Uh, 10, 10 hydrogens per lanthanum. Also, it has a very interesting structure, but it's, it's also simple in a way uh, for that kind of compound. 
Okay, now the rest of the story is going to relate to the hydride superconductivity. <coughs> so what can drive room temperature superconductivity? Conductivity from around 1985, um, there was a, uh, what I call a prescient video of a different type, um, how to produce room temperature superconductivity. Well, just um, for our amuse amusement, we will learn from this what the key is. Okay. I'll turn this sound up. Okay, I really hate to stop this song in the middle because I like it a lot, but um, the message is here that Queen and David Bowie uh, knew that there was something special about pressure and people being under pressure, well, also materials being under pressure. So um, we'll go back to the serious part this <clears throat> and Neil Ashcroft who got his bachelor's degree at the University of New Zealand which is now called Victoria University uh, then went to Cambridge England and got his his PhD in 1964 and, and thinking about metallic hydrogen hydrogen because it's the lightest element there is, and probably you know that hydrogen, um, the common form of hydrogen is in the H2 molecule, which is very strongly bound. And uh, <clears throat> Neil Ashcroft knew at the time that creating metallic hydrogen would require a lot of pressure. Uh, this early time, he had no idea how much, but he already um was suggesting that metallic hydrogen would be a high temperature superconductor <clears throat> and the theory wasn't well enough developed and uh, both the electronic structure and the amount of pressure and whatever so he he didn't offer any a number for how high it might be he didn't know okay there wasn't the information available and metallic hydrogen uh doesn't yet uh, exist. At least there's no consensus. There have been three, four uh, published papers uh, claiming to see signals of metallic hydrogen at pressures something more than 300 gigapascal, more than 3 million atmospheres. And the best calculations suggest that that hydrogen will become elemental, not, not um, molecular, but elemental and metallic around 500 gigapascals, which is very, very high pressure. In 2004, 
uh, Neil published another single author paper uh, saying hydrogen dominant metallic alloys would likely be high temperature superconductors under pressure. And that's what's been found to be true now. And Ginsburg, who was uh, awarded Nobel Prize in early 2000s for his part in the theory of superconductors, was also talking about hydrogen rich materials under high pressure as being possible high temperature superconductors. I uh, just mentioned Brent Matias back in the 1960s and into the 1970s liked to like to kid theorists a lot. They said theorists are useless in helping us to find better superconductors. And, and that was more or less true until these hydrides hit. And then the, the theory and the computational expertise had been developed to the point where um, these first two hydrogen rich materials were predicted correctly to be superconducting and to be really fabulous temperature wise superconductors uh, predicted before the experiment. So let me just give you an idea of what is involved in, in the calculations. I won't go through these things here, but <clears throat> the key quantity function that it needs to be cal calculated is called alpha squared f. And it's a function of frequency. This is phonon frequencies. So there's an upper limit of whatever it is, 100 uh, MeV, milli electron volts, uh, give or take a factor of five, depending on your material. But what you need to do to calculate this is this is the electron phonon matrix element. So this has both the electronic properties and phonon properties in it. The electron wave functions throughout the band have to be calculated and the band indices are M and N summed over and the branch index of the phonons, that's the number of branches you have, which is three times the number of atoms in the primitive cell. So this matrix element involves electron wave functions uh, and phonon uh, characteristics also. Phonon wave functions, if you want to call it that. Uh, and there's this double integration of K over three dimensions and Q over three dimensions. So that's a substantial amount of work. Uh, but you have two delta functions here because the initial electron uh, has to be on the Fermi surface. And after scattering, it also has to be on the Fermi surface. And then this is frequency resolved. So all of these phonon frequencies that come in here and the branch index, those are projected on H bar omega. And then you plot this as a function of omega. F of omega is just the phonon density of states and alpha squared is the, the mean uh, square coupling at frequency of omega that comes in here. So this is a substantial calculation. The phonon coupling strength of lambda is given in terms of this function simply by the integral over this function one over omega. So it's the inverse frequency moment of alpha squared f. Now the second frequency moment is called omega sub two. There's also a first one called omega one, but there's also one that what you get if you try to go down to omega sub zero is you get a logarithmic frequency uh, here, and uh, Phil Allen and Bob Dines in 1975 um, studied this theory. The, the actual migdal ili Ashberg theory that this goes into is a complicated theory in itself, uh, but that's what they were solving. Dines was taking tunneling data from which you can extract alpha squared f experimentally. And Alan was doing the theory, solving the Ely Ashberg equations and fitting the results to a simple function, 
it doesn't look simple. I'll show it to you. Uh, but it's a simple function of these parameters. And in fact, uh, if you want to ignore the difference between these two frequency moments, that's okay for basic understanding. Mu star is a Coulomb repulsion constant, which usually is not known exactly, but it's typically between 0.1 and 0.15. Um, it accounts for the Coulomb repulsion between the two electrons that are being attracted by the phonons. So we're not going to do any heavy theory after this. Uh, okay, I, I won't mention that. <clears throat> so this is a, a paper that was almost right. The Yanming Ma's group in 2014, May, published this paper. Uh, what they did was to put hydrogen, uh, dihydrogen sulfide, into their pressure cell. I'll show you the pressure cell in just a moment. Uh, <clears throat> if you notice, well, sulfur is just below oxygen in the periodic table. So this is almost like a heavy isotope of water, H2S. Uh, it's better known as rotten egg gas. It's, it's the stuff that really smells, but you can, uh, of course, liquefy it and then put that in your pressure cell. And, uh, but they, they studied the uh, likely <coughs> stable phases of H2S under pressure. And here's a curve. I'll just show you here. Pressure. These are calculated numbers. Uh, the critical temperature versus pressure in this space group P1 bar. It's a very low symmetry space group. And then at 160 gigapascals, there's a structural transition from this structure to this one. And the calculated TC goes up to 80 Kelvin here and then decreases with more pressure. That's in H2S. Well, that is, turns out, um, I'll neglect these right now. I'll show one uh, next slide, a little bit more. <clears throat> Later that year, Chan Sui's group published this, and they wrote this as H2S sub 2 H2, but this is really H3S. and uh, um, Okay, they did pressure studies and so forth and so on. But what was um, determined in later experiments within a year or so was that this is the structure. Sulfur here, it's a very simple, it's a cubic structure. It's body-centered cubic. Uh, it's a, basically the simplest thing you can imagine. Sulfur surrounded by four hydrogens and each hydrogen bonded to two sulfurs in all three directions. And very high uh, frequency, mean frequency, a strong lambda, 2.2, and at 200 gigapascals pressure. And I'll just show you here the phonon density of states. And all of these phonons are hydrogen with its small mass. Its frequencies are high. And sulfur is the dashed part here. So they happen to be separate, and that's... That's actually an important feature for understanding what's important uh, for superconductivity here. And that was uh, the main focus of that paper I mentioned earlier. Now, here's alpha squared F, but this is a ro low resolution uh, calculation of it because it should look a lot like F of omega into structure. It should just be weighted by alpha squared. So some parts may be decreased and some parts increased and so forth. But this, um, this integral over these, you see this is just a series of broadened delta functions, many delta functions they calculated. And they got lambda 2.2 and other people doing this more converged to get very similar value and a very similar value of TC. This is correct. <coughs> Now, the way the experiment is done, um, these figures are taking, taken from some of <clears throat> Mikhail Aramit's uh, works. And twice I have had the pleasure of visiting him in his lab, and he's shown me around. 
Here is what's called a diamond anvil cell. And this contraption might be, you know, maybe two centimeters in diameter here. I don't know, something you can easily put in your pocket and not be noticed. Now inside there is the diamond anvil. So what is done is to have these diamonds, because diamonds are very, the hardest material we have, have them cut nicely. So when you apply a lot of force to them, they're less likely to break. So you have one um, here, one here, identical, and they're focused down here, actually a lot like a gemstone to, to a small area here, because when you apply force up here to this area, um, the force that applies down here is multiplied by the ratio of the areas. So you get more force, and when you push these together, more pressure. There is a metal gasket here, which is deformed by the diamonds as they squeeze together, um, seals up uh, the edges here, and then their sample is in here. And then there's a little piece of ruby um, whose vibration, one of its vibrations is monitored in the experiment because it's very well established how that frequency behaves with pressure. So that's the pressure measurement. And this is just showing for uh, hydrogen 3 sulfur. Um, this sample became superconducting at 185 Kelvin. That's the onset here uh, at a pressure of 177 gigapascal. This is another sample, which is not hydrogen, but it's deuterium. So it's, it's twice as heavy as hydrogen, but otherwise it's the same. Uh, but it changes the frequencies, hydrogen frequencies, by a factor of square root of two. So um, BCS theory predicts that the TC should go down. It's called the isotope effect. And it, it goes down a lot in hydrogen sulfide, shown right here. Um, but according to the theory, works well. So uh, that's one demonstration that it is the hydrogen material is doing this the superconducting. And they also measure the these curves when a magnetic field is applied down here. That's not so easy. Well, actually, this if you make this right, you can just put the whole thing inside a large magnetic magnetometer. Um, and as you increase the magnetic field, the critical temperature decreases. And that's an important sign that it is superconductivity that's causing this and not that, you know, a lead fell off or something like that. This is, this is a tough experiment. And usually, very often at least, at the end of the experiment, well, the experiment ends when these diamonds break. <coughs> to give you an idea of the size, um, Mikhail let me watch as he, under a microscope, um, ground this edge to flatness and this edge to flatness. And the size of this is such that if you drop it on the floor, um, it's, it will take you a little while to find it because you can just barely see it. Um, it's that small. So you handle it with tweezers and microscope. OK. So this is a simulation that my postdoc at the time, I should have the name out here, Antia Botana. And the I would say the world's expert on this kind of calculation, Francois Gigi and I did. <coughs> and this is called an ab initio molecular dynamics calculation. Molecular dynamics with just analytic force fields or potentials have been done for decades, but only since uh, really the 1990s have uh, these forces been determined by density functional theory. So at each little displacement of the atom, you re do, do the calculation again and get the new force and then move the atoms according to the force a little bit and do the calculation again. So this is 
what you're seeing here is real um, hydrogen three sulfide uh, vibrating at 200 Kelvin uh, and a pressure corresponding to the, the maximum TC of this material. The main thing you see here is how much the hydrogens move. Sulfur is much heavier. It has a weight of 32 or 34. Hydrogen is one. So you can hardly see the sulfur move. And in a normal material without hydrogen, uh, you would hardly see anything move at 200 Kelvin. Um, but here you can see in the hydrogen displacement is very, very large, very interesting. And there's been quite a bit of theoretical study of that. Okay, recent developments in understanding hydride superconductivity. Very, very quickly, a couple of slides here. Uh, okay, this is just the various things one has to calculate. Um, I guess this is being filmed, and if people want to look through this later, uh, they get an idea. But what I want to say, I told you earlier that there is this Allendine's equation for superconductivity, Tc as a function of lambda, this mu star, which is about 0.1, and log logarithmic frequency. And these two factors out here take into account one is a strong coupling correction because without that, this doesn't behave right as lambda gets large. And the other one is a shape correction. So if you have a, a very simple phonon density of states, this will just be one. But if you have a more complicated one that's spread out bimodal, something like that, this gives you a shape correction, how, how it influences TC in, in the Ashberg equation. Uh, <clears throat> and so here is things being plotted versus lambda. And the dominant, the dominant um, discussion over the years has been increasing TC by increasing lambda. And I'll show you on the next slide that um, that is not what's been happening. This is just showing how if you leave out these factors right here, then TC divided by omega log here versus lambda uh, increases like it should here, but it goes to a constant over here, it goes to an incorrect constant. And once you include F1, um, that doesn't happen. And it actually keeps increasing as the square root of lambda here. And so that was uh, one of the big messages. Here's, here's the expression. One of the big messages of this paper is within Eli Ashberg theory, there's no upper limit to the electron phonon coupled superconducting critical temperature. As, as lambda gets large, something else may happen. It may change the structure. Well, that does happen. But uh, within the pure theory, if you can keep, keep this in a favorable structure and just increase lambda, which you can never do, uh, TC will continue to go up. Well, what has been happening, I've shown here, what leads to high TC? So 1975, um, the largest lambda materials were not the highest TC, but lead bismuth alloys, or maybe thallium in there too, all beside each other in the periodic table. These are very heavy atoms. Uh, lambdas up to 2.5. Uh, the <clears throat> frequency measures about four milli electron volts, very low, and TC in those materials were seven to eight Kelvin. 2001, magnesium diboride was discovered. The, the frequency scale goes up by a factor of almost 20. TC went up to 40. But lambda is only about 0.8. If lambda had been two here with this frequency, TC would have been much larger. <coughs> 2014, hydrogen three sulfide, lambda 2.2, calculated uh these are all calculated numbers except these alloys um 
The frequency scale is 150 milli electron volts and TC is around 200 Kelvin. And finally, lanthanum hydride, hydrogen 10, lambda calculated is around 2.4. The frequency scale is increased very noticeably here. And then the TC comes out to be a little increase here, a little increase here, goes from 200 to 260. And th that's the, the highest accepted number. There's another paper out which uh, what was put into the diamond anvil cell was carbon, sulfur, and hydrogen. And uh, signals of superconductivity were seen up to 280 Kelvin, which is, which is room temperature in a cold laboratory, right? <coughs> um, but that's, that's still controversial. Okay, but what we find here is that a factor of nearly 20 increase in the frequency here from here to here has produced a factor of, uh, sorry, frequency from here to here has increased TC by a factor of 30 going from here to here, while lambda has hardly increased, or you could say it hasn't increased at all. So the high TC that we've been seeing is all because the frequencies are getting higher, but we're retaining, we're retaining coupling. At the at least lambda is not decreasing. So lambda has hardly been increasing at all. The large lambda regime of metals, which has been speculated about and and uh, there have been various calculations of various kinds probing this regime. It's yet to be explored properly and understood because experimentally we're not close to lambda 5 or lambda 10 or we'd well, like to see. <laughs> so that's that's the conclusion. The next hundred years, well, one thing uh, people are trying to do now, theorists, is to figure out if there's some way that one can reduce the needed pressure and get superconductivity high temperature superconductivity into more applications. And there's still a lot of basic understanding of, uh, although the expressions are pretty simple, uh, understanding what, uh, what makes those electron phonon matrix elements large. That's, that's the main thing that's outstanding right now. So with that, I'll conclude and I'll be happy to take questions. Okay, so first of all, uh, I would like to thank you very much for your excellent webinar and ask everybody to turn on their microphones for a huge round of applause in retribution for this. Okay, so uh, we already have some questions, which I will uh, pass to you. But uh, while people uh, uh, write down or think about their questions a little more, uh, let me just give you a panorama of the audience we had during your, your talk. We had around 100 people, if we put together this virtual room, and a useful participation. And... Uh, so uh, we have people here from uh, different places in Brazil, from north, northeast, southeast, like Amazonas, the states of Amazonas, Pará, Rio Grande do Norte, Espírito Santo, Minas Gerais, Rio de Janeiro, São Paulo, some of these places, places you've been to, as you mentioned in the beginning. Uh, obviously, we have uh, people from Pará University, uh, undergrad, graduate students, postdocs, teachers, and professors like Angela Kautau, Vitor Dimitriev, Valdomiro Jr. Uh, not only from the city of Belém, Pará is a huge state, so we have from cities of Ananindeua, Capitão Posto, Castanhal, Mar Marabá, Santa Isabel. These are strange names for you, I believe. But we also have people from, as I said, all around Brazil. Uh, I should just mention once of them, one, uh, some of them to... to Register, I mean, uh, Ardo Jório from Minas Gerais, Ciclâmio Barreto from Rio Grande do Norte, Edson uh, Zacarias from Unicamp, Enzo Granato from INPE, Giorgio Torrieri from Unicamp, uh, Maria Carolina Aguiar de Minas Gerais, Raimundo dos Santos, Rio de Janeiro, Satish Kumar also, and Silvio Salinas from São Paulo. But we have also people from abroad, 
like Igor de Marcos participating from South Korea, Isaac Hamidis from Mexico, and we also have the honor to have uh, Professors Michael Kosterlitz and Professor Bill Phillips from uh, United States with us today. And uh, well, uh, the the first question comes from Sati Skuma from from the the first one of the first video you sh you've you shown, shown us. Uh, shown us uh, Satish, do you Satish, want to make do you want to make yourself? Uh, uh, thank you, Luis. I'll try. Can Can you hear me? Is it working? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Perfect. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, th thank you, Professor, for the great talk. I think with that uh, skate, uh, that, that that skateboard video and the Queen song, you you have officially replaced Richard Feynman as the coolest person in physics. <laughs> <laughs> you, you must be a celebrity among undergraduates in your university. Okay, can I? Okay, can I? Can I put that on? Can I put that on? I, I, yes, yes, I, it, it's certified. If it is. I, I think if you are on Instagram or social media, you 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 a <laughs> great success. <laughs> um, I show the exact same video for my students when I teach the pressure thing, so I was very happy that, that you you did the same thing. Okay, so um, uh, my, my okay. By the way, w what was the kind of superconductor used in that skateboard, um, and what? I I I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to turn this. I'm going to turn this. No, I think. No, uh, I think Satish, 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 you have to, you have uh, to turn off your microphone while he answers, not to give a echo. An echo. Okay, please go ahead, Professor. Okay, so uh, I don't know specifically. I haven't had any information on, but I think it's almost certainly uh, yttrium barium copper oxide, because uh, I'm sure what what it's filled up with is. A superconductor and then liquid nitrogen um, inside it to keep the superconductor cold for a while and the the common by far the most common superconductor with uh, TC of above significantly above 77 Kelvin is yttrium barium copper oxide and and there's plenty of that there's plenty of that Got it, thank you. So I'm a theoretical physicist who works mostly in gravitation, high energy physics. So I'm very ignorant of the superconductivity. So I'm prefacing this because the question I'm going to ask is very pedestrian. So um, like how do one go about selecting certain alloys or materials as the candidates for testing superconductor? What's the guiding principle here? Thank you. The Guiding principle, I would say, over the past years, there haven't been useful guiding principles. Uh, those those high, highest TC materials back in the 1960s and early 70s, actually up until 1986, were these cubic materials called A15s. And there was a lot of activity around the world in various labs just to optimize TC in, in that. So it was niobium, and finally it was a niobium and then aluminum germanium uh, um, alloy on the germanium site that had the highest TC. Uh, going to other materials was uh, just a guess, but uh, niobium is the best elemental superconductor and um, it was the best compound superconductor also uh, in those years. So niobium compounds were looked at a lot. Then, uh, but nothing better was found. And then the cuprates came along and everybody switched to cuprates. So it was complete surprise in 2001 that magnesium diboride, which is another phonon mediated superconductor was discovered and it, it's completely different. All the others had been based on transition metals and magnesium diboride, the two SP materials. So uh, <clears throat> now uh, it, there are quite a number of these metal uh, hydrides that have been calculated. So metal atoms, yttrium, even uranium, uh, Presodymium, 
um, who knows what. It's mostly um, SP materials and not transition metals, just because that's that's what seems to be working so far. But it's it's like searching in the dark, really, because there aren't rules, any rules formulated to help us to understand why um, hydrogen sulfide is not as good a superconductor as lanthanum hydride. It's very good, but not as good. Others that you might guess would be good. Um, calculated just have a TC of 40 Kelvin or something like that. Really disappointing. Uh, these things are not uh, understood beforehand. And in a couple of papers that my group has written, what we've been emphasizing is that there is uh, the guts of this matrix element, which is the change in potential when an atom change in the electronic potential when, when an atom is displaced by an infinitesimal amount. That's what comes into the matrix element. And that's what has not been studied in any detail yet. And if that would be the case, and I'm going to, uh, uh, I should have already uh, urged the right sorts of people um, to do this. But it, it's it's this matrix element that really needs study. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Satish, for your questions. Thank you, Professor Warren, for your answer. So the next question comes from Professor Bill Phillips. Uh, Professor, do you, would you like to turn on your microphone and make the question yourself, please? Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, I have uh, uh, actually uh, uh, two different questions. One was it uh, the um, the data that you showed the historical data from Camerling Onis on the uh, uh, superconducting transition in in mercury looked very sharp, and a lot of the later pictures that you showed us, uh, even for the BCS uh, uh, superconductors, uh, looked like they had a significant slope. What makes the difference? The difference is. Um due to inhomogeneities in the sample. Um, if they're really good samples, the, um, the transition can be really sharp. Now, the Camerling onus, you could still see the slope there from, from normal state resistivity down to zero. And it seems like he was varying the temperature uh, by very small amounts going along that curve. So, but but again, mercury, you can make very clean mercury, and so it should have would have been a very clean sample, I think. When you get inhomogeneities, uh, all sorts of things can happen in in the data, and there's a phenomenon now that's been been uh, referred to for decades now as USOs unidentified superconducting objects. And if you have really inhomogeneous crummy samples and do these measurements, um, it can happen that you get a drop in resistivity that's sharp and, and large, maybe not to zero, but large. <laughs> uh, and it's just due to the current in the sample taking a different a, a different route to the sample and maybe missing a lead so you measure zero voltage when when the interpretation is incorrect so i thank you for your question and i'm also very happy that you tuned in to listen to this you, your your mic is off sorry my second question is, in, in 1969, when I was a young undergraduate, I went to a lecture by Bern Matthias. And my recollection is that he had a set of phenomenological rules that he was following to try to get to a higher uh, TC. I also remember 
that uh, there were a lot of different opinions about about him. Some people thought that he was uh, uh, an alchemist and a charlatan, and other people thought he was a genius. And what I'm wondering is, what is the modern view of what he was trying to do? Okay, so thanks for bringing this up. Uh, I've certainly addressed the Matthias rules in uh, three or four of the papers I've written, probably, probably even in the paper in the Brazilian Journal of Physics. Uh, when I went to the conference in Brasilia, there was a proceedings and uh, they were published in the Bra Brazilian Journal of Physics, I believe is the title. And it's, I, I think that's what I put in that paper is quite important for people interested in these questions. It, it has to do with phonon driven superconductivity. Um, Matthias's rules were uh, first, um, cubic is best, maybe not first, but the three rules, cubic is best. Um, there are certain electron per atom ratios, two of them. If you plot TC of known superconductors versus electron per atom ratio, like niobium would have five, molybdenum would have six valence electrons and so forth. There were two special peaks there. And, um, and the D electrons were best, transition metals were best. Uh, later on, uh, it, it was added by him or attributed to him, whether were added to him by him or not. Uh, stay away from oxygen. And um, I forget, but the, but the sixth one was stay away from theoreticians. He, he liked to, he liked to poke us theoreticians. Uh, so those rules broke down when magnesium diboride was discovered. It's not cubic, it's not transition metal. Uh, okay, it doesn't have any oxygen, <clears throat> but it's boron. Um, so Matisse's rules just evaporated. They applied quite well to transition metal elements and to binary compounds. But, but when you go to a different part of the materials space, different compounds, um, you, you have different, you, nobody formulated rules, I guess, but you have different considerations. But is, is there any way of understanding whether or not they, they made any sense or was it just chance that, uh, that uh, uh, these things corresponded to what he observed? <laughs> okay, so um, there's certainly sense to it. These two peaks in the electron per atom ratio correspond to two peaks in the density of states, which occur in the transition metal elements and their alloys. Uh, also, similar things happen in niobium and tantalum uh, carbides and nitride, and in the, the cubic A15 materials, a niobium 310, a, a TC of 18 degrees. The, the issue of being cubic, I think the most revealing comment I heard about that was from Phil Allen. And it is that when you have uh, less than cubic symmetry, the compound can relax, can adjust the structure, uh, structural components, not the, not the space group, but structural parameters, lattice constants, or internal parameters without changing the symmetry, but um, lowering the tension in the material, electronic tension, however you want to define that. But one, the most evident way to to characterize that it is by the density of states at the Fermi level. And sort of general picture understanding is that if you have a high density of states at the Fermi level with some structure, if it can 
if it can relax, if it can, yes, relax atomically to lower the density of states at the Fermi level, that will likely be more favorable energetically and it will be less favorable for superconductivity. So having a cubic structure uh, can freeze in this, this high tension in the electronic system and maybe elect large electron phonon matrix elements. Yes. Thanks, that's great. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Bill Phillips, for your questions. Thank you, Professor uh, Pickett, for your answers. So the next two questions comes from, come from uh, Campinas. So the first one is from uh, Giorgio Torriere. Uh, he is in, the, in this virtual room. So Giorgio, uh, do you want to make the question, please? Sure. Um, thanks. Thanks for the talk. Interesting. Glad to know that you visited here. Um, yep. Yeah, uh, I am. Uh, I'm also uh, from outside the field. I'm close to particle physics, and the question is, I mean, you showed the formula of the BCS theory of how TC of how TC depends on the coupling constant and on the Fermi surface, and it's it's sort of a an easy to understand formula, right? I mean, it's a condensate, and it's the scale of the condensate in terms of fluctuations and whatnot. Um, uh, I mean, and you mentioned the surprise in the 80s when this thing went up by an order of magnitude. Uh, uh, where this th is there a qualitative, I mean, you mentioned these density functional calculations, but is there a quantitative understanding of where particle physicists call this a hierarchy problem, right? Something that is orders of magnitude above what you expect. Is there sort of a short intuitive explanation as to why for these materials the critical temperature jumps like this? So you're referring to the cuprate superconductors yeah. now? Well, yeah. all high temperature superconductivities and superconductors in general. Yes. So uh, the, the leading theory and understanding in the Cooke rates is that um, the mediation is primarily fundamentally magnetic in origin and you have a, um, well, what you don't have in mag magnetism that you have when you're studying phonons is uh, what's called Migdal's theorem, that you have a different energy scale for the phonons and the electrons. And in, in good metals, that's the case, and that allows you to simplify the theory a lot. When you're dealing with magnetism, that's electrons, so that the, the electrons at the Fermi surface are electronic states, uh, but the electrons that are forming the the local moments on the atoms, cuprate atoms, uh, are also electronic, and there's no separation of energy scales. Uh, and so it's highly reasonable that you might get higher TC there. But um, but there, well, in my mind, a, a, there are several theorists that think that the interesting questions in cuprates have been settled. I would like an explanation of why TC in lanthanum cuprate, when it's doped, the maximum is 40 degrees Kelvin. Uh, in bismuth, two layer compounds, three layer compounds, the maximum TC is about 100 degrees Kelvin. If you go to the mercury compound, which is the record holder, it's three or four layers, I forget which it is, uh, 125 degrees Kelvin. What What's different between 125 degree Kelvin superconductivity and 40 degree Kelvin? And even there are 10 good cuprate materials that have TC of just uh, 10 degrees, single layer compounds. So, I think that's what is lacking in uh, really 
being able to say that we understand the mechanism of superconductivity in cuprates. <clears throat> what what the Earth have done? What the Earth have done really is to, f in a somewhat material dependent fashion, a microscopic, is to form a, a set of Eliasberg equations and a function alpha squared f, which the f it would be the spectrum of spin fluctuations and alpha squared would be the corresponding matrix elements. Uh, and then to treat that within Ilyashberg theory, Ilyashberg like theory. It's just that that form isn't justified by theory because, <clears throat> because we're using perturbation theory and Migdal's theorem says you just calculate the first diagrams and you're, you've, you've got everything to 1%. So that's about as much as I can say about your question. Okay, thanks. So basically, so basically, the issue was it's BCS that had two scales which mix. Um, cooperates, you said magnetic superconductors have one scale that determine everything. Is that a fair statement? Or two, you know, two scales that are close together. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Giorgio, for your question. Thank you, Professor Warren, for your answer. So the next question comes also from uh, Campinas, but uh, from a participant uh, from YouTube. It's Jefferson Bettini, and he has written, Professor Pickett, thanks for the excellent presentation. Please, can you make some comments about the superconductivity in interfaces and 2D materials? <clears throat> Probably nothing useful. I, I've uh, I've studied the electronic structure and magnetic structure of some oxide interfaces, yeah. um, but I've never got into uh, trying to model the superconductivity or calculate superconductivity. <clears throat> there is a lot of interesting superconductivity at these interfaces and two-dimensional systems uh, that you mentioned. So it's, it's ongoing research. Uh, I'm on the program committee of uh, the next low temperature physics conference, LT29, which is going to be held in Japan. And uh, there will be invited talks related to interface superconductivity. Uh, such things as putting a superconductor like aluminum against a ferromagnet like europium sulfide, I forget who did that, uh, published papers. Uh, the, uh, the abstract is claiming that they produced triplet superconductivity at that interface. That's something that people had been sort of expecting might happen. So 2D superconductivity is a, a very active and very open field right now, I would say. Great for study. Okay, so thank you, uh, Jefferson, for your question. Thank you, Professor Ward, for your answers. Uh, uh, so if you have more questions, please. Uh, uh, so uh, we just have uh, Eliao Marcelino has raised the hand. Uh, so is he in the room. Uh, would you like to make the question, Eliao? Yeah, Professor Luis, thank you. Uh, well, thanks, Professor Warren, for, for this lecture. My question is regarding to the, the biggest challenge that we currently have for reducing the pressure uh, close to the room pressure and still keeping the, the superconductivity of the materials. Oh, so, so in that regard, there are two related questions, I think. <clears throat> attempts what to do. One is just to to produce a uh, metal hydride which uh, superconducts at very high temperature at just 100 gigapascal or even less, 80 or 60. Uh, the other thing is to, uh, and people are thinking about this, it is pers perfectly possible to produce a new compound at high pressure 
and then if you can release the pressure carefully then you can perhaps retain the same structure and about the same properties as you lower the pressure a lot it would be metastable but that's okay um, if the barrier that it would have to go over to get to the more stable structure is large enough um, the metastable structure can be you know quite useful uh, diamond is metastable graphite has actually got a slightly larger binding energy than diamond but of course diamond sitting on somebody's ring finger um, doesn't switch to graphite it's extremely stable material strong bonds mean that it would take a lot of energy to break those bonds and reform graphite bonds so that doesn't happen unless you unless you raise the temperature to 2000 kelvin or something like that and just set the carbon atoms free um, <clears throat> right now uh, how to how to retain superconductivity at a lower pressure is is what the groups that are doing a lot of these calculations on the hydrides are thinking about and of course some are going to ternary compounds two metal atoms plus hydrogen it becomes quite more complicated to to find the most uh, st stable structure at a given pressure All right, Professor, thanks for information. Big challenge regarding to this meta stable at the room temperature and pressure. Thank you. Right. Okay, so thank you, Elio, for your question. Thank you, Professor Warren, for your answer. Uh, professor, uh, do you think that machine learning, uh, what about machine learning? I mean, do you think it can, in a sense, help in this, in this challenge? <clears throat> machine learning is is being used and actually the first stab at this was done a little bit more than a decade ago i think 2009 or so by um swedish Sw swedish student and professor i think uh erickson was the professor <clears throat> but he was using very simple descriptors uh i've even heard of one attempt where the descriptors were just the atomic number and some atomic energy and maybe a couple of other things atomic size <laughs> and i don't and i think that hasn't been productive really there may be slightly different opinion but um what one group is doing is to look at different structures and do the density functional calculation, just, just the ground state electronic structure of the material and take some quantities from that. Now that's very simple to do. Uh, even if you have a lanthanum hydrogen 10 or something a little more complicated than that, that's very simple to do. That's a, maybe a good machine, maybe a 10 minute calculation. So you can do a lot of those and you have real material dependent structure dependent information which you can put together with uh, the, the, the full calculations on a few of these materials and start the machine learning project so i do think and certainly there are are several people in the field that think that that's going to be a very useful uh, direction of study. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think Professor Bill Phillips wants to make a, an additional question. Please, Professor. Yes, uh, toward the end of your talk, you were emphasizing that the improvements in the um, uh, in in the the critical temperature for uh the the, the uh, phonon coupled um uh, superconductors was due to the uh, improvement in the uh, the characteristic phonon frequency omega rather than to the um 
of the strength of the uh, of the coupling lambda. And if I'm remembering correctly, you said, well, for a 20-fold increase in the, in omega, you got a a 30-fold increase in the uh, in the critical temperature. But I seem to remember that the prediction was that there should be a square root dependence, and that's more than a linear dependence. So what happened there? Well, what happened there is that uh, this square root dependence uh, is the strong coupling limiting behavior. And the, the I've, I've fooled around with the numbers a little bit in that equation. You're actually fairly close to the limiting behavior by lambda of five, <clears throat> certainly by lambda of 10, but lambda of five. But, but still, we don't have materials with lambda greater than 2.5. So um, we're not approaching that limit yet. OK, thanks. Okay, thank you, Professor Bill Phillips. Thank you, Professor Warren. Uh, so maybe uh, uh, I don't see more questions in the audience and in YouTube. And maybe just a final thing that I'd like to ask you, as we were talking in the beginning of, uh, uh, I mean, just before we started uh, uh, recording. So about this, uh, about one year ago, there was a paper uh, in Nature uh, talking about uh, room temperature sup superconductivity, and there have been recent claims, right, uh, against this result. I mean, maybe if you'd like to comment something about that, and maybe uh, kind of close up with your find, find, find final comments, please. <laughs> Okay, so I mentioned that there have been three or four publications at least um, claiming to see signals, at least, of uh, metallic hydrogen at 400 gigapascals or, or maybe more, <clears throat> 350, 450. That's about as high as, as one can get with diamond technology these days. The diamonds break. Uh, <clears throat> but... But the data is limited. Uh, what experiments they can carry out and build into the diamond cell is, is very limited, uh, even at 200 gigapascal. And what can be done, is done, is uh, resistivity, of course. And you can measure resistivity versus magnetic field to so see if it behaves like a superconductor should. Uh, <clears throat> groups are now doing a susceptibility studies and susceptibility uh, swings at TC are quite large in um, <clears throat> relatively speaking of course they have very tiny samples so and and what's inside the diamond animal cell when it's pressed like this um, there's no guarantee that it's very homogeneous what is done typically is to uh, to press and then release a little bit and apply some heat that is laser heating to try to anneal it a little bit uh, press and release and so forth and so the sample quality is a real question uh, homogeneity and the lack of uh, very many probes that you have it is fairly common now to do Raman scattering uh, through little little peepholes that you can get your light through, um, even maybe some infrared absorption. That's I think a newer, later, more recent technique. So if you look just at at uh, general data at high pressure. Often it's not of the quality that you would see in a nice single crystal without pressure, just sitting on a lab bench. It's, these are difficult experiments under non-optimal conditions. And it's certainly the case that the experimentalists can get fooled by the data. Um, so that's, that's what I see is it's tough, and um, it can be also tough to convince the, the readership that what your interpretation is is really 
uh, justified by the data. It'll be interesting to see how this controversy <clears throat> comes out. Okay, Professor. So, uh, well, uh, I would like uh, to thank you very much once again for your wonderful talk. And I'll ask everybody to turn on their microphones once again for a final round of applause in retribution for that. Thank you very much.